Welcome to part two of your essential dose of Schubert Insight today. Now, in the lab, our skeleton France has got angel wings on. I'm, I've got the tubes of rather mysterious coloured slime in front of me. So a reminder of why we've got these extra pop props in the Schubert lab today. Our lab project today. Your lab project is to prove whether he was a composer up with the angels or bathed in slime. Now, that bathed in slime quote comes from uh, Josef Kenner, who was a friend of Schubert's, but Carl Rossmann on Twitter has got in touch with me to say that actually schlam, the original German word which he's gone to research, means mud, not slime. But, you know, one man's mud, another man's slime. Either way, it's not essential. The idea is it's, uh, it's dirty, uh, not clean. Now, uh, we were talking earlier this morning about Byronic Despair and Heavenly Music, but here's really Exhibit A, um, something... Um, you're going to hear the voice of Elizabeth Norman Mackay, Schubert's biographer, on a piece that she thinks absolutely absolutely proves the connection between Schubert's tortured mental, mental state and his physical state to in the year he was diagnosed or knew he had uh, syphilis. Have a listen to this. There's that one sonata, late piano sonata, where he goes completely mad. Is it the A minor one? Yes, it's hideous. <laughs> And it's that middle section where... Manic piece. Absolutely manic. It's so hideous. And if anybody tries to make it beautiful, they can't. And it stops, and then it's all beautiful again. That, I think, is a, a marvellous description of what manic depression might be like. Elizabeth Norman Mackay and that amazing uh, A minor sonata. Look, well, with me to, to think about, discuss how, what the relationship between these physical states, especially uh, that Schubert was going through late in his life and his music might be. Paul Robertson, violinist and music, the brain specialist, joins me again, as does Professor Tony Pinching, who's, who knows about the effects, especially on creativity, of potentially terminal illnesses, uh, especially AIDS. Look, um, Tony Pinching, what, what's your analysis then, or how does um, the threat of a, a disease that probably is going to kill you. How does, that, what, how does that affect somebody's creativity, somebody's psychology? Well, it's, it's obviously going to be a very individual issue, and for some people it might destroy their creativity. So we shouldn't take away from the fact either the particulars of the illness or that threat may have been too much or interfered with creativity. But certainly from my own observations and from reading, it's pretty clear that for some people it gave a focus, an urgency, and I suppose a heightened sensibility um, to their artistic and creative expression. Uh, and I suppose what we're looking for is the way in which that would have enhanced or modulated in a positive way their creativity. So what have you experienced in particular? I mean, examples of, of what you mean? Well, uh, obviously, I can't talk about most of my patients because it's confidential, <laughs> but uh, Derek Jarman was a, a very fine filmmaker and artist and was very public about his aides and the fact that I was his physician. So I'm uh, not breaching any confidentiality here, but it's very clear that from the point at which he was diagnosed as being HIV positive, his um, creativity changed. He was clearly very creative when he mm. produced Caravaggio for, Caravaggio, for example, uh, which is just prior to his diagnosis, although he may well have suspected it. But his films subsequently were incredibly rich, incredibly intense, and there's a real sense that he was compressing things in an in intensity that, that was unusual for any other person. Right, well, Paul Robertson, do you get the same sense when you listen to the, the music that Schubert wrote, well, really, since then, since, since late 18, 1822, and music like that sonata? Well, I think it's quite likely true for all of us that, you know, what Johnson said about knowing you're going to be hanged in the morning concentrates the wine wonderfully. Um, you don't hang about when you know time is short. Um, now, s some creative individuals, and dare I say it as a Jewish creative individual, I hope, uh, particularly the Jewish temperament, is always very morbidly af affected by the fear of death and, and can create a kind of compulsive creativity. Schubert clearly had his own personality, but I think this, what should we say, it's almost like, an ex for most people, an excessive zeal to come up with something new and beautiful, to taste the divine. And, of course, the trouble is when you taste the divine, you're faced with a dilemma because 
You can't, no human being can stay in that divinely inspired state all the time. When you're not, by gum, you feel like, you, mm. you do feel like slime. <laughs> so, I mean, Tony Pinching, there is a, a sort of, I mean, a kind of almost a really a horrific, tragic Faustian bargain about all this. You know, that it's only when, for someone like Schubert, someone like Derek Jarman, that being faced with the inevitable where we're all going um, is sort of what you need in order to, to, to make these things happen or to produce that hyper intensity of work and indeed achievement. Well, I suppose, you know, all of us have the opportunity of life and it's what we make of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I suppose, you know, we all will address at various levels of intensity fundamental questions about, you know, where are we, who are we, where are we going, who are we with, you know, life, death, love, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and I think the question things, yeah. is, you know, if you do have um, an ability to start to express some of these things, um, then you have the language to convey it. I think music is exquisite in that respect. Having the threat of death and serious illness constantly hanging over you must have given that sense of urgency and focus. And I, and I, and I didn't, you know, I don't think we should overinterpret it, but I, th I, th I think it's there, and it's it's not hard to see why he clearly had a melancholic disposition, cyclothymia or whatever prior to a, a kind of a kind of manic depression. Yeah. Otherwise, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there are accounts of him. I came across one from a friend of his, Shazy, who wrote. A, a as soon as the blood of the vine was glowing him, Schubert liked to withdraw into a corner and give in to a quiet, comfortable anger, during which he would try to create some sort of havoc as quickly as possible, for example, with cups, glasses and plates, throwing them around. Uh, and as he did so, he would grin and screw up his eyes tight. I mean, I mean Paul Robertson, I suppose the danger with these kinds of things, especially with a sort of inevitably uh, retrospective medical or, or psychological diagnosis of a composer, is that we maybe we interpret everything he did, or especially that late music, through the of this morbidity. I mean, at a certain <laughs> point, perhaps that actually isn't a very helpful way to think about this music. Well, I think I think we've got to bear in mind that um, that as a normal person, and in his case, he was what we might call hyper normal. I mean, he had an immense capacity to love, and very few opportunities to really express or do so. Now, that's difficult. He was a young man. He was stocky. He was libidinous. I'm quite sure. Um, he couldn't. He was denied marriage because of his economic situation, as far as we understand, and other things. Getting angry when you've had a few drinks it would not be at all abnormal in a situation yeah. like that. Trying to, to as it were, um, find a, a higher expression of, of the mm. same pressure, but within the creativity of music, is a noble thing. But you know, give the chap a chance. I mean. You know, he was, he was still a bloke. Well, this is the thing. You see, Tony Pinching, it, it seems to me that one thing... I mean, look, Schubert's 25. He probably knows, uh, even though people weren't necessarily talking about it, that he had a, a kind of syphilis at the end of 1822. So he would have been told not to indulge in sexual relations anymore, to which the response would be either sort of go to a monastery and, and that's it, or, you know, a, a much more a, a equally understandable reaction, go and do all the things that you're supposed to not to, not to do, i.e. indulge yourself more, indulge yourself to the max, precisely because you know that time is shortened. I mean, that's a, a human reaction. I mean, is that a common thing? Well, I think, you know, yeah, humankind is many and various and uh, certainly uh, you know when the witness of AIDS I would say the vast majority uh, were extremely careful as soon as they got their diagnosis but undoubtedly some may not have been and that may have been a reaction part of the anger the knocking things around mm. um, but I think you know it whether it influenced his problem about forming relationships with people um, that he would otherwise have done mm. as Paul has said um, who knows the extent to which that that uh, was a specific instruction uh, from his physicians or whether it was something that he felt was a responsibility. Who knows? Well, uh, Tony Pinching, Paul Robertson, uh, thank you very much indeed. I mean, in a way, these things are tied to their time, but what syphilis meant at that time, a disease that now can be uh, treated, thankfully, uh, but are absolutely things that in contemporary context we can all understand as well. Paul Robertson, Tony Pinching, thank you very much indeed. A reminder, this is your Schubert Lab too. You can get in touch at schubert at bbc.co.uk or text 83 one. I'll be back at, uh, when will I be back? Quarter to six on the in tune Schubert Salon with uh, Thomas Guthrie baritone and a puppet, puppet version of Schubert's Die Winterreise, more late music. But um, Schubert and who he is goes on uh, with, with Penny Gore. Penny. <laughs>